name is Will PC, and this is my Some Like It Hot presentation about solar thermal market opportunities in the United States. Um, I'm excited to kind of talk about this topic. I, I, you know, right now I work from a company that does a lot of solar thermal, but you know, my whole uh, career has been around solar energy policy, and I have a special place in my heart for solar thermal. So um, hopefully you'll get a little bit out of this and maybe think about for your company whether this is something that you want to explore and whether there's any opportunities for you here. Um, a little bit of background about who I am and I guess I apologize beforehand on some of these slides. I've tried to cram a little bit too much in there. So sorry if it's a little small. I'm happy to send folks slides for things if you want to come up to me afterwards. Um, but I am the current Senior Director of Government Affairs for SolarRay. SolarRay owns several companies uh, two of which, AET and Sunearth, are the largest solar thermal flat plate collectors in the United States, which means we are a domestic producer of clean energy technology, which very few companies can say these days. Um, we also own a wholesale distribution company, an O&M company, and a commercial generator backup company. Uh, myself, I have uh, 10 years of experience in the renewable energy policy landscape. So I used to design small-scale PV systems. Um, before that, I was a paramedic. But for the last 10 years, I have worked in policy in lots of different states. I started out in Hawaii uh, doing rooftop solar policy. I ran the Hawaii Solar Energy Association for several years. Um, I went and worked for SIA, which is the National Trade Association for Solar, um, based in D.C. And for them, I ran the Southeast region, which included 11 states across the South, where I live today in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I now currently sit on the board of both SIA and CALSA. CALSA is the uh, California Solar and Storage so Association representing uh, solar heating and cooling interests of the industry. Um, and I've served uh, as a lobbyist uh, in lots of different states for lots of different solar design policies from rate design to rooftop solar to tax property to utility scale, decommissioning, and solar thermal. And I've served as an expert witness um, on matters of solar rate design for distributed uh, solar technology like rooftop solar and for solar thermal in lots of different states, including California and Hawaii. If anybody's heard about NIM 3.0, I was uh, an expert witness in that case. I served as an expert witness in Georgia, Mississippi, Virginia, lots of other states as well. So that is kind of my background. Um, I've got a couple different degrees in, in policy that I'm working on, but here I sit uh, before you uh, as a member of the Solar Race team. So we're going to talk today, my presentation is roughly split into two parts. One is an overview of solar and thermal technology, which is a little bit of a rarity, I would say, in the overall market in the United States, but it is a kind of old and very, you know, well-designed uh, functioning technology. So we're going to go over what it means to be solar thermal um, and the different types of systems that you could design or you could look at. Just a very brief overview. I'm not a tech guy, uh, so if you ever have any questions about solar thermal, I can tell you who the right person is to ask. Um, and then we're going to transition to talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. So raise your hand if you've heard about the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, everybody has heard about it. So there are lots of parts that have to do with solar energy in general and solar thermal specifically, and we will go over those parts for both residential and commercial and industrial applications. And then we'll have some time for questions after anybody's got any. So, what is a solar thermal system? Does, any, does anybody have an experience installing solar thermal systems? Or, okay, great, that's good to hear. Um, so, it is a water heating technology that utilizes solar thermal as heat. So, unlike PV, which uh, converts solar energy into electricity, this just produces the direct thermal energy from the sun um, to heat generally things like water. There are things like solar chillers that exist. Um, but for our purposes today, we're talking about solar thermal for water heating for domestic hot water use, for industrial process heat, agricultural heat, space heating, uh, cool heating. So this is what solar thermal technology is. It's been around for over 100 years. Um, it directly heats water, uh, typically in a collector, or it heats water through a medium, like a glycol solution. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of solar thermal, which we'll go over. Thermal siphon, unglazed, which are things like uh, pool heaters, glazed flat plate, our, what our company makes, concentrated solar power is a type of solar thermal energy. So if anybody's been to Nevada to see the solar power tower, yeah, it's got those huge mirrors that heats up, I think it's molten salt, um, to a very, very high temperature, and then that is used to create steam to run a turbine. 
Um, and then things like evacuated tubes, which you might have seen, especially in places like Europe or South America. So this is the biggest offender of Tiny Slide Day. Um, this is from a, there's a yearly report that comes out about the international solar thermal market. And I pulled a couple slides to kind of give you a sense of what the market size is. Uh, the slide on the left um, is about, mostly about commercial sized markets in different market regions. So you've got what types of solar systems are being installed where. On the left hand side, you can see that big purple bar, I think is China with a really large utility scale solar thermal system. So these are just massive solar thermal systems in China. And then you have places like residential and commercial solar thermal systems, blue and, and um, I guess that's kind of a greenish yellow color there. Um, and then just the different market regions um, on the bottom, places like Europe, Austria, Israel, has a lot of solar thermal, places like Saudi Arabia, South America, Africa, um, and the good old North America and United States of America. Right hand slide, you've got large scale solar systems for all different kinds of usage, whether they be residential, public, and commercial buildings, or even things like industrial process heat. That huge uh, bar on the left is, again, China. They're investing heavily in solar thermal for a number of different uses. Um, and then you've got many other countries and regions after it, things like Latin America, uh, Great Britain. You've got um, MENA countries, so that's basically the Middle East, um, and lots of different countries going down to Australia. Uh, for a variety of different um, uses and types of systems, collector area, green is the collector area, so that's how many collectors are installed, um, and then orange is the number of systems right above it. So we talked a little bit about what solar thermal systems are. These are just a, a few pictures of, of what I was talking about. So on the left hand side, you've got um, glazed flat plate collectors. So that's typically what you'll see in a, a residential commercial setting, especially in the United States. Um, if you see a solar thermal system, I was um, in Madison, Wisconsin yesterday, uh, and I went to Glass Nickel Pizza Company, and apparently they have a solar thermal system that I think is made by one of our companies on top of their roof, um, without snow, and hopefully generating hot water. Uh, but then you've got a concentrated solar power, so that's a solar power tower. It's really just reflecting uh, sunlight at, um, at the same place at the top of the tower and then heating a medium, like molten salt. You've got unglazed, uh, what are called unglazed or non-glassed uh, solar thermal systems to heat pools. So they're usually a little bit of a lower temperature. You can get a higher temperature with a glazed panel. Um, an unglazed system heats it to a lower temperature, but it heats a very wide area relatively efficiency, efficiently for a pool. And you've got things like evacuated tubes, right? So that would be, you know, I think there's a system in maybe Germany or Europe somewhere that has, um, you know, an evacuated tube that runs water through it that heats with the solar thermal energy. This was a handy slide created by um, a member of our company talking about the general efficiency of the system as you go up in its design. So uh, it's important to remember that solar thermal as a technology writ large is very efficient compared to other types of water heating technology, especially um, if you consider where it's being installed and how it's being installed. And I'm saying efficiency kind of as a, not necessarily, I mean, they are cost effective and cost efficient, but more as like an energy efficient technology. So if you compare, I was just having this conversation downstairs, but if you compare a PV system to heat water, it's taking 23% efficiency, so taking 23% uh, round trip efficiency for turning heat or turning thermal uh, energy into usable electrical energy versus solar thermal, which is you know 90% efficient, right, for that thermal energy hitting the collector and then heating the water. Um, on the left hand side, you have quote unquote the least, the kind of lower efficiency system, which is called a thermocycling system, which is generally uh, a less expensive system. You might have seen these systems in places like Israel, they're very popular. They have a tank at the top and the solar collector at the top, and it just heats hot water. Um, and then you kind of move up to active drain bags, indirect glycol, where they heat a medium. So you would see that in like a cold weather climate, right? Where you're, you want to avoid freezing water, so you're heating a glycol solution that is run through a water tank to heat the water inside the tank. Um, and then you've got active direct heating, right? So you see those things like um, white has a lot of those types of systems because it doesn't really freeze very often in white. For these last three systems too, um, and for the first system as well, generally for solar thermal systems, you also have a backup. 
um, solar thermal pairs with any type of backup, whether that be electric resistance, whether it be heat pumps or natural gas, or I guess geothermal or some other type of heating technology. Um, all solar thermal does in that case is it raises the efficiency of the backup technology. So the cop of your heat pump will go up to the solar thermal system and it works less times, right? Because the solar thermal system generally is doing much of, most of the work. Um, in the United States, you have metrics like solar fraction. So what percentage of the entire water heating energy comes from solar versus um, some other technology, whether it be electric resistance or heat pump. For solar thermal, you want to shoot for things like 90% um, solar thermal. So 90% of the energy you're using to heat water comes from solar thermal, whereas 10% would come from somewhere else. So these are just kind of the general types of systems. There's lots of different types of system design, though, but these are the ones you see most commonly. There are lots of applications for solar thermal, which we talked about. Um, centralized and hybrid multifamily, uh, space heating and cooling. We do a, a lot of systems in Colorado for radiant floors. So you can use uh, solar thermal systems for radiant flooring, even in places like Vail, Colorado. Application needs, we talked about pools, culinary application. Uh, generally, in the mainland United States, um, solar thermal energy tends to skew a little bit more on the commercial side than it does the residential side. But then when you go to uh, island communities like Hawaii, where I've lived and worked for many years, or Puerto Rico, or the Caribbean, um, a lot of those use cases are more residential. Uh, but you can use solar thermal for a variety of different, you know, any water heating uh, type, any water heating application you can think of, be it domestic hot water to industrial process heat, depending on the type of system, you can use solar thermal. Uh, and then, right, you have industrial, and then you've got residential, direct water heating and cool heating and space heating. Okay, so we're going to transition a little bit to something I know much better, which is the policy world. So we talked a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act. What it was was a landmark piece of legislation that was passed in 2022 that did a variety of different things, from uh, boosting uh, EV manufacturing and tax credits for electric vehicles, to boosting energy efficiency, to clean energy manufacturing, to uh, clean energy development, transmission infrastructure, all kinds of stuff. Uh, was in this bill. It's one of the largest, um, I think it is the single largest clean energy bill ever passed. Um, and, you know, it's on the level of things like the New Deal, right, in, in terms of overall investment over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. $370 billion worth of investment, 40% reduction in greenhouse gas reductions by 2030, and projected increase in hundreds of thousands of clean energy jobs, whether they're direct jobs, like, you know, working for a manufacturer or indirect jobs, like working for a policy in, in a clean energy company. So there are a few provisions that impact solar thermal either directly or indirectly. Um, things like 25C and 25D, so these are tax credit sections that deal with um, residential size systems. The energy efficiency home improvement does not directly impact solar thermal, but it does if you think about envelopes of energy efficiency upgrades for residential buildings, right? So if you're including, you know, windows and lighting and you have an energy efficiency uh, performance target to meet, solar thermal typically can meet that performance target without getting other technologies and potentially lower your cost. But then you have direct um, provisions like 25D. So everybody probably knows this tax credit, especially if you have a solar thermal or a solar EV, a solar PV system on your home, 25D is that tax credit that gets you 30% back off the cost of your system. Then you've got section 48, so this is dealing with larger systems. Um, these are the kind of commercial, quote unquote, commercial size systems. Um, we have some really good news about 48, and I think this is the big takeaway for this whole presentation is we got uh, in, a, in late November, the IRS put out proposed regulations for 48 talking about 48E. So 48 is a tax credit that's similar to 25D until 2025. So at the end of this year, it transitions into what's called a tech neutral tax credit. And a tax credit is split between two technologies, either a qualified project or an energy storage project. And then 48 is important because you can stack those tax credits, as we'll see. It's actually the more, I guess, lucrative tax credit if you think about it for larger systems. It was unclear uh, if 48E, anything that happens after 2025, or after 2024, actually, at the end of this year, applied to solar thermal. But we and 
SIA and many other organizations made the argument to the IRS that we do qualify as a thermal energy score system. And they have proposed regulations that took our advice, and now it turns out that it seems very likely that we do qualify, both before 2025 and after. So if you were nervous about whether solar thermal was going to qualify for Section 48E, I would not be very nervous anymore. So it's a big deal, because you can take all those tax credits and stack them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but also in Section 48 is the manufacturing tax credit, uh, are there any manufacturers in here? None? I am a manufacturer. You're a manufacturer. Do you manufacture clean energy equipment? You do? Do you qualify for 48C? You do? Great. Okay, so you're a happy guy. Um, unfortunately, Solar Thermal is not quite happy yet because we don't qualify for that yet. Um, but I will make it happen. Um, there's other grants and loan programs. For those of you that pay attention to state programs, you know, you might have noticed that there are RFPs going out and RFIs going out for things like the HOMES program, things like energy efficiency investment. There's even IILJ funds coming through um, from several years ago, but it's billions and billions of dollars for a variety of different clean energy programs, whether that be energy efficiency or generation or EV or infrastructure that are starting to roll through state and local governments and tribal governments that will also impact solar thermal over the years. But that, that money is kind of the slow money versus the fast money, which is tax credits. But there's a lot of money floating around, and a lot of it affects solar thermal is kind of the underlying point. So we, there's a bit of a deeper dive into the residential tax policy changes. I'm not going to go through this whole slide. We talked about it um, in the previous slide. But again, that 25D is the kicker for solar thermal. It's the 30% it's the for applicable clean energy projects, and then it steps down after 2032 to zero. So you've got 30% from now until 2032, unless the law changes, and then zero in 2035. That's kind of the key thing to remember. And then, obviously, in 25C, there's a host of energy efficiency home improvements that you can include with your solar thermal system, if you decide to install one. So commercial, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Again, we talked about Section 48. Section 48 is interesting because it has changed now, because we have this base tax credit if you meet uh, labor laws in your, in your state um, of 30%. And then you can add another 10% for an energy community, and another 10% for domestic content, and then up to 20% for a system that's situated in a low-income community. So, you know, think about, you could get almost a 70% tax credit back um, for a solar thermal system, for commercial, or, you know, a PV system, I guess, if you wanted, or any type of clean energy system that qualifies under that tax credit. And if you are a, um, nonprofit organization or a state or local government, the law has also changed in that you now receive direct pay. So if you are a state or local government and you're applying for this tax credit for a system you're installing on your property, you can get that money back in a literal check from the federal government to you the following year um, for a tax credit, which is a new change. So I think this opens up kind of a broad new horizon for not only you know, these kind of commercial and industrial products that we've seen, but for things like solar thermal, which, you know, we've installed a bunch of solar thermal systems in places like California for low-income housing, you really see this start to make a lot of economic sense for investors that might not otherwise want to choose clean energy because the capital wasn't there or the risk was too high for that, that sector or whatever. So now you kind of see that changing, and I think you'll continue to see it post-2025 when we transition to this tech neutral credit. And then we've got 48C, the manufacturing tax credit, which we talked a little bit about. It does not yet apply to solar thermal, but the hope is that it will kind of stimulate a clean energy manufacturing market here domestically. And we're trying to get away from international supply chains in the US. This was the, the point of the IRA, partly. Um, jury's out on whether that will be effective or not. Uh, but there certainly seems to be room for, uh, and there certainly seems to be a lot of announcements for new clean energy manufacturing, whether it's for EVs, whether it's for PV, um, module manufacturers, inverter companies, energy storage companies. Uh, so we'll see, but you know, that's kind of a constantly changing landscape, I would say. But it wasn't there before. Uh, one key definition that is a little bit new to this tax credit world is 
things like energy communities. So energy communities, if you build a system in an energy community, which is one of these shaded communities here, you would qualify for a 10% adder to your base 30% tax credit, getting you 40%. If you get domestic content, you get another 10. An energy community is defined as three different things by the federal government. And if you Google energy community slash DOE, you will find this map. Um, so I would encourage you as you're developing projects and you're trying to think about what your tax basis is and you know whether you can finance that project or whether something will kind of kick you into being able to finance it, I would really look to see if you're building a system in an energy community. And generally, these are communities that are either a brownfield site, as defined in a CERCLA, a metropolitan statistical area that um, is basically a, a low middle income area uh, or an area that has a low unemployment or a high unemployment rate, or a census tract in which a coal mine um, or a coal-fired electric generating unit has been retired after 2009, or a coal mine is closed after 1999. So you can see, you know, Navalich and Mountains, right? Those are all coal mines that have closed after 1999. Those are energy communities, and then their surrounding counties where those communities were are also energy communities, because the idea is that people would drive in to coal mines from other counties, so they are affected by the closure of that coal mine. So now you get a little bit of a boost, to build clean energy in that community by the federal government through Section 48. And then you've got brownfield sites, which I don't think are on this map. Um, and then I think the purple areas there are what are called those metropolitan statistical areas um, that are talked about in that second bullet. So we've talked about these all. This is just kind of all one, uh, one graph where you can see all the different things that impact solar thermal, and then all the different things that would impact, you know, potentially other clean energy like PV or wind or um, geothermal is even included in some of these. Um, but there's lots of different money out there, and I, I point out a few of them too, because the Energy Loans Program Office, obviously, the LPO, if you've heard of that, they are going out every day to look for new ways to invest the government's money into developing new projects or developing new ways to you know, build clean energy in the United States, whether that be through things like decommissioning and processing and recyclable material, or building a new type of solar thermal collector or PV module or inverter or whatever, you can go to the loan program's office and get a pretty competitive loan to go out and build that stuff to scale. You have things like rural electric loans and REAP, uh, which are programs that focus on agricultural communities or rural communities, which are generally fairly un underserved um, by all uh, solar. But I think the, the kicker for solar thermal is that it does not require, I mean, one of the issues for rural solar right now is finding places where you can install a big utility scale solar system that can connect to the transmission and distribution grid, right? Um, and whether you're close to a substation, because that really kind of makes the difference for a utility scale developer, how close you are to the substation, because that is gonna determine how much it's gonna cost you to interconnect that system. For solar thermal, we don't run on electricity, really, so we don't have that, um, that problem. And so we have systems, for instance, that are installed in like chicken farms in North Carolina that provide a lot of um, heated water uh, for agricultural purposes, and it don't take up as much space as a utility scale solar system. So things to think about, this is money potentially available for those types of systems. And then the new energy efficiency homes credit, uh, it depends on where your home is being built and what part and whether solar thermal qualifies, but you can get a tax credit for including energy efficiency equipment such as solar thermal in your new homes development. So that's another place where you can find this money. So a little bit more on energy efficiency changes, and really the second bullet is the important bullet because this is where all that money is starting to flow through the IRA that's not having to do with tax credits or rebates. Um, this is money that the federal government is taking from the IRA and giving to state energy offices, right? So I work a lot in Hawaii. The Hawaii State Energy Office over the last two weeks has sent me, I think, like four or five different RFIs for different programs that they're either putting money from the federal government in to expand or they're looking at opening up for energy efficiency equipment, whether it be rebates or marketing opportunities or loan programs or green banks. You know, all that money is starting to flow from the federal government into states, into tribal areas, into localities and municipalities, and um, other local governments. And we're going to start seeing that, and I think, you know, if you're savvy, and you know that these funds are 
in the area where you're developing a project or thinking about developing a project, you can utilize them and stack them on other things like tax credits, rebates, you know, whatever you can find. Okay, so I think we talked about this throughout the presentation just generally. There are some major differences between the old tax regime and the new tax regime under the IRA. We covered things like Section 48 tax credit stacking, right? So that's a new thing. Um, huge expansion of federal money going into lots of different levels of government. Uh, new tax credits for manufacturing, for transmission and interconnection buildouts, for EE, for EVs, for weatherization, and a major inclusion and in an effort by the federal government to include low middle income communities, indigenous, and native communities, state and local governments, rural communities. You know, I think there's a huge investment not just in the typical places where you would see this money flow through in the you know, 10, 15 years past, but in kind of new new areas, and the direct pay for nonprofits. That's another huge kicker that I think is a bit of a sleeping lion because it, it not only affects nonprofit organizations and churches, but it affects state and local governments, right? So if you can go to a city and you can convince them to install a utility scale solar thermal system to power their um, district heating system, like Chicago has a district heating system that could potentially be powered by solar thermal like they do in Denmark, that city of Chicago will get a check from the federal government the next year under 48, right? That's a new thing, and that's a pretty landmark thing, I would say. Okay, so it's my colleague's favorite slide, the cake. Um, again, we're talking about tax credit stacking. So as long as you qualify for that base 30% rate with uh, labor laws, you will qualify for a 30% base investment tax credit for whatever technology would be under Section 48. Most renewable energy technology, including solar thermal. But then you add stuff on top of that. 20% if you're going under the low income rules, which are cap limited every year, but you could potentially apply. Uh, domestic content bonuses, so this is for domestically produced clean energy that meets certain requirements. And then energy community bonuses. We talked about energy communities, but you're, if you're there, you potentially qualify for that too, right? So you add all that up and you have a 70% tax credit. In this example, you have a million dollar project, you're getting $700,000 back in Section 48 tax credits. And if you are a direct pay recipient, you're getting that in a check the next year, $700,000 for you. So your system costs $300,000 now after that first year. On the left-hand side are basically where all the money is going um, through the IRA. So as you can see, a huge portion of it is things like tax credits, the Section 48, Section 25, Section 45X, um, renewable energy and clean energy production tax credits. So those are things like utility scale solar systems get the PTC, the production tax credit. But then you have things like clean manufacturing, um, commercial energy efficiency, nuclear energy is in there, hydrogen, EVs, EV charging, uh, transmission and interconnection we talked about, carbon capture, all kinds of stuff in the IRA. This, that makes up that $375 billion. Um, quick question, does anybody know which two states are projected to get the most amount of IRA money over the next two years? Just name one, if you can name one. Two states that went for it. New York. Who said Texas? Good, that's one. What's the other one? Anybody know? Is it New York? It's Florida. Florida. Texas and Florida, and then if you keep going down that list, most of the southern United States are going to receive a lot of IRA money, right? But Texas and Florida are going to get billions and billions of dollars over the next few years through the IRA. Whether they accept it or not, they're going to get it because people are going to come in and build stuff. Um, and their markets are huge, right? Think about how big Texas is as, a, as an energy market, right? As a, as a building residential market, as a commercial business market, it's massive. Um, Florida, similar, right? So those are the two states, and a lot of red states, I think, politically red states, are going to get a lot of IRA money, and a lot of southern states are going to get a lot of IRA money. And then there's going to be a lot of money flowing into your kind of typical states where you would see renewable energy, places like Colorado, California, New York, Hawaii, uh, but not as much, right? It's mostly red states, mostly southern states. Okay, so this is kind of some outlook. So my old employer, SIA, puts out uh, a report with Woodsmack about just investment and the impact of the IRA. That light blue is what they were looking at pre-IRA. Um, I think this is for solar installations and gigawatts. So this is you know mostly solar PV. 
but I, I think that the slide speaks for itself, right? Because you have this light blue where you kind of just got this steady step-by-step -step climb every year that kind of almost follows inflation. And then you have the IRA, right? You have this dark blue, this kind of 20, 30-fold um, change in installation year over year, and it grows exponentially, right? But, you know, SIA, Woods Mac are obviously biased. They're a trade association, a solar trade association, so they want to make it look good. So then I pulled things like Bloomberg. What are they looking at for IRA, um, for climate fighting investments? You know, Goldman, Credit Suisse, CBO, they're looking at a huge investment, almost 1.2, I think that's 1.2 trillion dollars that Goldman is estimating in investments as a, as a direct result of the IRA in fly, fighting things like climate change. And they define that as like installing renewable energy. A massive change in jobs, according to, uh, I think that's Edison, Edison Institute? No, that's not EBI, that's another uh, trade association. But they pulled, they kind of looked at what the 2025 job projections will look like and the 2030 job projections will look like on a low blue, medium yellow, and then high, this kind of orange red, on the impact of new added jobs because of the IRA, right? So you can see in 2025, the high estimate is more than half a million jobs potentially added because of the IRA. Out to 2030, 1.5 million jobs just, just because of this money, new jobs that wouldn't otherwise have been there. And you know, if the solar industry or whatever was gonna keep ticking along without the IRA, it would have added a lot of jobs anyway. So this is just icing on that cake, potentially. So think about, too, all that potential tax revenue that's going to be generated because of these new jobs, new industries that are going to pop up in places that you haven't seen before, right? When I was working at SIA, one of the last things that I did was I went to Georgia twice in the space of four months to go to an inverter manufacturing plant opening and a solar module manufacturing plant opening in Georgia, like outside of in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. Um, you know, those types of job openings are going to just keep popping up. Um, all over the place, specifically because of this IRA investment. Okay, so we talked about this tax credit eligibility issue under Section 48E. Because of those proposed regulations, solar thermal is defined as a thermal energy storage technology under 48E, right? So as long as those proposed regulations go through, which it seems like they definitely will, um, you know, you are good to go for a solar thermal installation under 48E after 2020. But there's more that needs to be happening, right? Solar thermal is not the market that it is in places like Israel, in places like Denmark, or Germany, or Spain, or Italy. It's not because the technology doesn't work very well, it's because people just don't really talk about it. People like me, there aren't a lot of 30 year olds in the solar thermal industry these days, but there should be, because this technology works well, and it pairs with everything else that you can think of, right? We're the federal government is doing a very good job right now pushing things like heat pumps for water heating. Solar thermal equally is an efficient technology potentially, right? Especially depending on where you live. Um, so it gets even more financeable with things like Section 48, which heat pumps don't uh, apply for. And then you have kind of longer term goals, right? Inclusion of Section of Solar Thermal Manufacturing in 48C for the tax credit to try to build more clean energy jobs. Again, my, you know, our companies were the only domestic content manufacturers that I know of for this type of technology. So, you know, we would like to see more. We'd like to see more competition. So hopefully they can include that in the manufacturing tax credit. And then advocacy and expansion for EE programs. There's lots of successful solar thermal EE programs in the United States. There could be much more. And they could be for residential. They could be for um, multifamily housing, right? Low-income housing. They could be for commercial, agricultural, and industrial process heat. If you wanted them, right? They just have to have the will to build them. And models exist. We just need to make them. So this is kind of what I look like, look for in you know my day-to-day -day solar thermal advocacy job. You know what could we fix to kind of build more solar thermal? I don't really want to make it where solar thermal is the only technology you can choose. I just want us to be on a level playing field with everybody else, um, because I think it's a good technology for a lot of different use cases. Um, and we've proven that in lots of different places. And now it just gets more and more relevant with the IRA. So I know that was a lot of information overload, and 